Welcome to the next session, the next steps in the coagulation process uh, and thrombus formation. We've talked previously in an earlier session about platelets. Today, we're going to emphasize the proteins that are synthesized elsewhere, mainly in the liver, and that are circulating within the bloodstream. They're indicated as little tiny multicolored dots there, the coagulation cascade. And there are lots of factors. So all those different colors, it's a different factor. You don't necessarily need to remember all of the details, but to get a sense of how this is put together, that's what we're here for. Okay, lots of details. Again, go with the force, feel the big picture. So the coagulation cascade is broken into somewhat arbitrary intrinsic pathway, and on the right-hand side, not yet coming up, the extrinsic pathway. The intrinsic pathway is activated by surfaces. So remember how we exposed collagen and, and other extracellular matrix? Well, that's a surface. Uh, it turns out that platelets forming the primary and secondary hemostatic plug also provide a surface. And that's how we're going to activate the intrinsic pathway factors. The intrinsic, factor, intrinsic pathway factors are shown here. So by general consensus, when we have an activated factor, they're all Roman numerals, by the way, but when we have an activated factor, it's indicated with a lowercase a. So the initial activation of the intrinsic pathway by exposing surfaces is through turning 12 into 12A. It's a conformational change. And then subsequently, we're going to have a variety of proteolytic changes. And again, I apologize for the complexity of what you're about to see. There are multiple, multiple factors that are involved. You're already getting a sense on the intrinsic side. They are numbered, not in the sequence. They are numbered based on when they were discovered. So it turns out that factor one that's gonna be all the way down on the lower right-hand corner was the first one that was discovered. Factor 12 was one of the later ones to be discovered. We just have to go with it. And they don't go necessarily even in appropriate sequence. Although what is shown here, <clears throat> 12 to 12A, 11 to 11A, suddenly we missed 10, it's 9 to 9a, and then we somehow we brought in factor 8a. Again, don't get too embroiled in all of the, the various details. Keep in mind the bigger concepts. Okay, so we have exposed the surface. We have activated 12 to 12a, and then it's going to, because of its conformational change, start proteolytically cleaving other factors. This allows us to get an amplification of the process because once we've made a protease, <clears throat> 12A, it can chew up a lot of different 11 to make 11A. And once we've made a little bit of 11A, it can chew up a lot of 9 to make 9A. So we get a cascade, we get an amplification, and that's one of the other kind of features of the coagulation cascade. There is a common pathway. So in the middle here, again, on the right-hand side, still blocked out, you can't see it, there's going to be the extrinsic pathway. It's also gonna feed into this common pathway. Oh, suddenly on the common pathway, number 10 has appeared. Okay, 10 becomes 10A, and it interacts with a cofactor 5A to get the next steps. And the next steps are that we're going to activate prothrombin. It turns out that prothrombin is factor two also called prothrombin, and it goes to 2A or thrombin by that proteolytic cleavage involving 10A and 5A acting in concert. As we will see, thrombin is an incredibly powerful kind of central component of the coagulation cascade. One of the major tricks that it does, one of the major roles that it has is in cleaving fibrinogen, which turns out to be factor one, Remember, we said one is going to be in the lower right-hand corner. Here's one. We're going to convert fibrinogen to fibrin. So one to 1A. And 1A is fibrin. And fibrin will polymerize to cement together all of those platelets. That's its main job. Okay. It turns out thrombin also acts on one of the very last factors to have been discovered in this whole cascade, factor 13. Factor 13 gets proteolytically cleaved by thrombin to 13A, and 13A, over a period of hours, will cross-link the fibrin. 
Why is this important? Well, this means that we've got a really stable plug, okay, because we've now cemented it all together with all this polymerized and cross-linked fibrin. The problem or the downside is that after four to six hours of 13A doing its thing, that fibrin clot, that fibrin cement holding the platelets together can no longer be degraded or broken down by the antithrombotic pathways, such as tissue plasminogen activator. This has therapeutic implications. So that if I have a clot that has been there for four to six hours, it's no longer amenable to therapeutic clot busting. We can't add TPA and expect it to be effective. So that's why we tell patients, if you're having a heart attack, get to the hospital as soon as possible because we can do something for you. So again, just normal features of the coagulation cascade, they have therapeutic implications. Okay, so we've done the intrinsic pathway into the common pathway into the final kind of pathway where we're getting fibrinogen, factor 1A, or 1, to become factor 1A. Okay, and then we cross-link it. All right, that's the intrinsic pathway. Of course, there's an extrinsic pathway, as, as promised. And the extrinsic pathway is activated by exposure to tissue factor. Now, tissue factor has a variety of names. I'm going to call it tissue factor for now, but it's also factor three. Hmm, how about that? It's also called thromboplastin. And the reason that I'm, I'm going to say those names again at some later point is because some of the tests that we use use the old-fashioned names. But anyway, tissue factor. And tissue factor is there underneath the endothelium all the time, but we don't see it until we get endothelial injury. And now we're gonna activate the extrinsic pathway. The extrinsic pathway starts with tissue factor being exposed. And then when factor seven sees that tissue factor, factor seven again is in the circulation, it will undergo confirmation change to factor 7A. And the combination of 7A and tissue factor together will then get us into the common pathway and we're off and running. So the rest of it is kind of what we've talked about previously. Okay, another important point because this is, um, well, this is how we drive the coagulation cascade or how we can potentially block the coagulation cascade. So a number of the various steps absolutely critically require phospholipid, so a negatively charged phospholipid on a membrane surface, and calcium. And you can see those. So going from 7 to 7A requires that I have phospholipid and calcium, similarly 10 to 10A, 9 to 9A, and prothrombin to thrombin, all require that I have a surface where I can have phospholipid, a negatively charged thing, holding calcium, which will then hold those various factors so that I can get the enzymatic catabolism. Okay, so these are very important kind of control checkpoints. Okay, so what's in a name? Why, why do we call it the intrinsic pathway and the extrinsic pathway? Well, in the intrinsic pathway, it's basically something that's intrinsic within blood that activates factor 12. It turns out that it's probably, again, remember it was a surface, it's probably negatively charged polyphosphate that's released onto the surface by activated platelets, okay? So it was something that was intrinsic to the blood and it turned out to be this polyphosphate from platelets. The extrinsic pathway, so remember it starts with tissue factor. Tissue factor is synthesized by activated endothelial cells, but it's also normally present only on the cells that sit below the endothelium, such as fibroblasts or smooth muscle cells, and is therefore extrinsic to the blood. Now you know. Hopefully that helps clarify in your mind how these various pathways kind of intersect and why they're named. So what's really going on in coagulation? Mm -hmm.